So I only have uh, two points to make about big history. Um, the first point is a uh, big history project is helping schools and teachers manage some of the huge enduring problems in education. Um, enduring problems, problems that have been uh, uh, plaguing people who have been teaching for uh, centuries, actually. Um, and secondly, uh, the Big History Project, uh, Big History offers students a chance to learn an integrating narrative filled with lots of stuff, that's a technical term us teachers use for what we have to teach, but also and most importantly filled with big questions and a deep sense of wonder. Those are my two points you could actually probably leave now. Um, what is big history? So big history is the study of almost 14 billion years of history from the Big Bang to the history of the future. And it's all in one course. Some people are teaching it in uh, a year, some people a semester. Some courses are actually being done in five weeks in intensive all days. What's the Big History Project? I'll explain that, but what we're doing is we're providing a free, flexible, and comprehensive course for secondary students all across the world. And we have students now taking this course in um, all across the United States, also in Bangkok, we have uh, Singapore, um, uh, Ireland, and Scotland, just to name a few. The course was created by this man, David Christian, a, 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 a scholar at Macquarie University who wrote a book called Maps of Time. Um, and he also created a teaching company set of videos about his course. Um, what David did was he created one big cosmic story built around this idea of increasing complexity. So what David did is he's arguing that this large narrative of, 16, of 14 billion years of time can hang around this idea of when do things become more complex in the universe and in our lives, and when does complexity become more interesting and make things more uh, possible. This man, Bill Gates, saw David's teaching company set of videos and fell in love with the course. And he said to David, why is it that this course is only being offered at universities? Why aren't students, secondary students in high schools, being able to take this course, this integrating course? And that collaboration between Mr. Gates and Dr. Christian created the Big History Project. And at the University of Michigan, I was blessed that David and the Gates people reached out to us so that we've been working on the curriculum and the assessment and this pilot of this project. So what's connected through big history? But actually, what I'm going to argue today is what's reconnected through big history. Um, what I'm going to argue today is this, that what we're really trying to do is connect kids' natural curiosity to the cosmos. Kids are curious about the cosmos, but we're trying to connect their curiosity to the content that they actually have to study in school. Um, and so, th for the alliteration, it's kids connected to their curiosity, to the cosmos, to the content that they have to study. So how is it that this course is helping teachers navigate the problems that they face? So I'm only going to mention some of these problems just quickly to show you what we're doing. One, many people understand there's a challenge here in adolescent literacy. Um, in part, it's a logical challenge. As kids go through school from fifth grade on, what we ask them to read and write and think about becomes far more complex. So they're reading more complex text and doing more complex things with it. Ironically, the amount of time we teach people to read and write the complex text decreases every year in school. Increased complexity, decrease in the amount of time we teach reading. Uh, the challenges in the core content. Everyone knows about the math and science issues. Everyone knows about these under-resourced schools. Right here in this area, we have schools that are just really struggling to actually meet the very basic needs of kids. From the time we created public schools, we were always worried about, are we preparing our children for the next set of challenges that a democracy faces? Um, I'm going to argue and spend some time the fact that the curriculum that we teach kids is in pieces. It's all, in, in, in many ways, broken. And unfortunately, we have disengaged students. Not the students that we saw on, the, on the, just the video, but um, federal reports have argued that 40% of American children, 40% of our kids are disengaged from school. In fact, they call them chronically disengaged, which means they're bored every day in, in school. Some kids claim to be bored every day in every class. So how is this course managing this? We first thing do lots of purposeful reading and writing, something I'll show you. We use multiple disciplines in order to cover 14 billion years all the content has to be connected. 
This course will, is free for all schools forever. It will always be free. The resources and materials, we have that commitment. This may be the only history course ever where this can be taught globally because it is the history of our cosmos. It's the history of all of us. And as I'm going to argue, we're putting all the pieces together. And in fact, there's interesting content connected to the big human questions. And those are the two points I'm going to really stress today. Well, let me start with this idea. School subjects need to be reconnected. And the argument I make is that for all of us, the high school curriculum is a curriculum in pieces. In some ways, things don't connect at all to, from one period to the next, from one course to another. In, in some ways, it's exactly as if I were to come in here and say, you know, I've got a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. Let's put it together. You might say, Bob, that's really great. I like putting puzzles together. What's it of? And I'd say, oh, I'm not going to tell you. That would spoil the surprise. You'll know after you put the pieces together. You're not going to show us the box top? No. Well, in many ways, that's exactly the way kids go through school because we don't tell them how all of these things connect to each other, how their first period class in algebra connects to their Western Civ course that connects to the course they're taking in world languages. The Big History Project course, though, does. Because what we do is we start with this grand narrative that shows how everything fits together that will allow the kids to dig deeper as they go later on in school. Now note this putting the pieces together, there are pieces left out. Because we don't really know these stories, and on top of it, we don't have the complete picture. So we're still putting in stuff, and stuff that we thought we knew, of course we don't. And later on, it, our knowledge changes. I also mentioned disengaged students. This thing stuns me. It's a problem that I've been working on for a number of years as a public educator. How is it that kids who live in a natural state of wonder end up so disengaged? These children wonder about where things come from. They wonder how things came to be. Why do we call things this and not that? How do things work? Um, what's going to happen, they wonder. How do we know the things that we know? What's going to happen in the future? What if? Why? How about? Now, I want to introduce you to just one kid. Let me introduce you to three-year-old Aaron and his Lycacon. Aaron was wondering about how it is that reptiles can live in a desert when the desert gets so cold. He was curious about it. So he began to use his imagination, and here's the Lycacon. And you note the little fire there that the Lycacon has in his uh, uh, lair. Uh, of course, there's a whole nesting area there. Aaron could talk about this for 40 minutes. In fact, I've heard him do it. <laughs> My question is, what happens to that that becomes this. Now, I've already told you I've got one theory. It's the curriculum and pieces. I actually have another theory about this. I think schooling in America is a bad game of Jeopardy. Now, what I mean by that is what we do is we give kids answers and we say, learn the answers, but we never ask them actually, what's the question? And what ends up happening is we ask the question only to see if they've learned the answers. So as a young high school student, I learned to hate questions because someone was always questioning me to see what I knew. And all what they were really doing is finding out what I didn't know. So what, and by the way, the curriculum comes delivered. This is the state of Michigan's curriculum, the way it comes to teachers. Those are only lists of answers that they want kids to be able to do. There's no questions connected to that. By the way, this is true in all of the states in the United States, not just Michigan. Now that's not how knowledge and understanding are born. That's not how they grow. Um, John Dewey, who used to teach at the University of Michigan, by the way, um, once said that all knowledge, everything you and I know, was once upon a time a question that someone answered, once upon a time a difficulty that communities disposed of, once upon a time a confusion that got cleared up, once upon a time a perplexity mastered. Yet what we do is we give kids question, answers without the questions. We give kids ant the, 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 the things that we've disposed of without the difficulty. We give kids the things we've cleared up without really touching the confusion. What the Big History Project does is it seeks to reconnect the school stuff, that technical term again, to the human questions, confusions, puzzles, and perplexities that generated the stuff in the first place. Everything in this course begins with questions. What happened? Why should we care? How do we know what we know? So we ask kids, what difference does it make by looking at things across grand space of time? How has our human understanding of things changed? What did the stars give us? Where did my gold rings elements come from? Um, how do the sun and planets form? The kinds of questions that Aaron was asking. I like the fact that we started with this question about what was life today because we asked that question. What is life? How do people think about it? What actually makes living things different from inanimate objects? 
Um, and we look at, of course, early humans. How did they learn to live? What did their language develop? And of course, civilization. How is it that human beings can learn to live together and keep some sense of order? Um, we also take up the question of acceleration. Knowledge is growing fast, faster even than our population. And of course, what a great thing to end a course in. We, we spend time talking about the future. What are the things that you've learned that help you understand the future? Now, in order to do this, we've got multiple other questions. I can show you some of these investigations. When and why should a person change their mind? A case study, by the way, of Copernicus and Galileo. How do new points of view pave the way for progress? When and why should a person accept a theory? It's a case study of Wegener and, and plate tectonics. Um, how have people misused Darwin's ideas? Has the modern revolution that we're living through been a force for positive or negative force? And ask kids to weigh the evidence on that. And finally, we ask them, are human beings still evolving? How do they study this? There's a real-time teacher teaching this, but we also bring in a virtual faculty. Brilliant scholars who come in and give mini lectures no longer than six to eight minutes. Cosmologists, paleontologists, chemists, physicists, geneticists. Um, they all start with a question. The man with the uh, beret on his head is Walter Alvarez. He was the person that discovered the uh, asteroids, destroyed the dinosaurs. He starts his video by saying, everyone loves, a, uh, everyone loves a mystery, a murder mystery. I'm working on the biggest murder mystery of all time. Who killed the dinosaurs? Let me show you a short example of this one. What was the early Earth like? And before I show it, think about what was the early Earth like. Roll the video, please. Imagine you're in a time machine and you've traveled back four and a half billion years. And what you're doing is you're taking a stroll on the early Earth. Now, what would it be like, and would you be having fun? Well, the answer is, I don't think you'd be having much fun. First, you'd be walking on molten lava. Ow. Not nice. <laughs> Secondly, you, you couldn't breathe because there's no oxygen. You'd be asphy asphyxiating. And thirdly, you'd be ducking asteroids, meteorites that are crashing into the early Earth, lots and lots of them. And fourth, you'd probably be throwing up because of very high levels of radiation. And if you stayed there too long, your hair would start falling out too. So I don't think you want to stay there too long. Why was the early Earth so hot? And so now the kids have a real-world question that they begin to think about and study things. Of course, what we're doing is we're using the collective knowledge of our, all of our humanity. And so these are the other virtual people that they meet and they study from, help to help them answer their questions of wonder. And of course, they're reading texts from many disciplines, uh, photographs from NASA showing the retrograde motion of planets to help them understand why Copernicus changed his mind, uh, 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 essays written by people, uh, journals from scientific magazines, copies of scientific magazines to show how it is we discovered the cure for plagues. Journalistic things we call lava surfers, which look at an, uh, an outdoor journalist wrote a piece about how it is you can understand plate tectonics from just simply uh, visiting the world in real live time. We don't want kids to actually just memorize someone else's narrative. So early in our course, we introduce them to the ways in which human beings make claims and support their claims. We teach that human beings have supported their claims using intuition, I feel this, my gut tells me this, authority, logic, or empirical evidence. And to help bring this home to kids, we've invented the superhero claim testers comic books. We have a small series of this. So we've got Evie, who's evidence. We've got Big S, who's authority. We've got um, uh, Vera, who is uh, the, the uh, sprite of intuition. And of course, we have logic. His name is and or. Um, <laughs> But what these things do is the students are constantly being asked, how is it that they're supporting their claims? How does David Christian support his claim? How does this cosmologist support his claims? And what they're learning then is that different disciplines could use different tools to support their claims. Every one of those virtual faculty that I showed you, not only do they give a four to seven or eight minute talk on their content, they also give another five to seven minute talk about why they wonder about the things that they're studying. The cosmologist talks about, is there life on other planets? And that's what I'm really curious about. Uh, the historian talks about how is it we've come to understand the past when the past disappears and leaves only, we can only understand through the residue of the present. 
Remember I told you I was only going to make two points about 14 billion years of time? Um, and so my two points again, that I hope you can see why it is educators from around the world are beginning to offer this course in their schools. It's helping them to manage some enduring problems of preparing young people for their future. And secondly, I hope you can see that what we've attempted to do is to reconnect kids to the wonder, that their chance to learn an integrating narrative filled with lots of stuff, lots of questions, and lots of wonder. What's our hope? That big history can inspire, can engage students throughout the world and prepare them for the challenges they face. My personal hope is that the Big History Project can help reconnect their schooling to their sense of wonder. And why? Because I really want Aaron and his wonderful Lycacon to feel right at home in his school. So I hope you'll consider us and join us at thebighistoryproject.com. Thank you.